This is African American History is American History. Welcome. I'm your host, Harlan Kearsley. This program's goal is to foster understanding, promote discussion, and expand knowledge through stories of historical events, bios of unsung heroes, as well as timely and relevant news stories which hopefully will paint a vivid picture of the effects of segregation, discrimination, and bigotry on the lives of both blacks and whites. Comparisons will be made between the many racially fractured periods of American history and what's going on right now. Slavery was abolished just 150 years ago. Jim Crow, only 50 years ago. Yet stop and frisk, voter ID, stand your ground, income inequality, and a host of other current problems are proof that their detrimental effects continue to be felt and that the struggle for equal rights for all must continue. CBS News correspondent Nelson Benton made a trip to the Mississippi town today. And here's his report on this civil rights visitor. Mount Zion Church churned under mysterious circumstances last week, and the three missing civil rights workers left Meridian Sunday to take a look at the ruins. It was somewhere in the vicinity of the church that James Cheney was arrested on a traffic violation by a sheriff's deputy. Cheney is a Negro. Cheney and his white companions, Mickey Schwerner and Andy Goodman, were taken to the Neshoba County Jail, where Cheney was booked on the traffic charge. The others held for investigation. They were released after Cheney paid a $20 fine. On the nights of June 21st and 22nd in 1964, three civil rights workers, James Earl Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, were shot at close range by members of the Mississippi Ku Klux Klan. Schwerner and Goodman, who were white, had each been shot once in the heart. But Cheney, a black man, had been beaten repeatedly and then shot three times. Many members of the Council of Federated Organizations, COFO, the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, were initially against bringing white supporters down from the North to share in the dangers of Mississippi. They felt that white volunteers would only increase the danger to local blacks because the presence of what many segregationists considered race traitors would only help to further enrage the Klan and other white supremacist groups. In 1965, John Lewis, then chairman of SNCC, felt that the white volunteers would actually help to strengthen the black communities by showing them that they were not alone, that there were people across the country, black and white, who were willing to risk the dangers and stand with them. This is wrong. Here I am watching newsreel footage of civil rights marchers being beaten and killed in Alabama night after night from the comfort of my own living room. And all I can do is cry after every newscast. That's Viola Liuzzo, a white woman from Michigan who believed so passionately in the fight for civil rights that, despite being a wife and mother of five children, helped organize Detroit protests, attended civil rights conferences, worked with the NAACP, and would eventually lose her life in the fight for equal rights for all. On March 25, 1965, she became the only white female protester to die in the civil rights movement. She was shot in the head by Klan members while giving a ride to a 19-year-old black man. One of the many civil rights marchers she had driven around Selma during the 1965 Selma to Montgomery marches that took place in Alabama. This is Viola Liuzzo's story. It's wrong. I can't ignore this. I won't ignore this. I can't just sit here watching people get beat up. This is everybody's fight. I'm going. I'm driving to Selma. I'm on my way. 
In 1943, she married George Argyris. They had two children, Penny and Evangeline Mary. They divorced in 1949. She later married Anthony Liuzzo, a Teamsters Union business agent. They had three children, Tommy, Anthony Jr., and Sally. Viola Liuzzo sought to return to school and attend the Carnegie Institute in Detroit. She then enrolled part-time at Wayne State University in 1962. She was academically still in her freshman year at the time of her death. Viola held to a strong desire to make a difference on as big a scale as she could. Another motivating influence on Viola's activism was her close friendship with NAACP member Sarah Evans. The two met in a grocery store where Viola worked as a cashier. They both shared similar views and support for the civil rights movement. You want to go where? Selma, I'm go- Yeah, yeah, I heard you. Have you lost your mind? Have you been watching the news? Alabama is a war zone. They're beating and killing Negroes left and right down there. Viola, your own people are going to accuse you of acting out of your place. And they won't forget that. Sarah. Viola, I swear I wish there were more white people as sincerely dedicated as you. But I would hate myself if I didn't ask. Are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into? I mean, protesting at Wayne State is one thing. But fighting segregation down in the belly of the beast is is just... Sarah, there's too many white people sitting around talking. Just talking about how bad things are. About how unfair things are. But they're not doing anything about it. And many of these are good people, people who know right from wrong, who know how bad things are. They still just sit around and talk. Well, I can't do that, Sarah. And I agree with you. If there were more white people dedicated to this fight, it'd be a whole lot easier to gain equal rights for everybody. But you're a wife, a mother. Hell, girl, you got five little ones at home. This fight is for them as well. Look, I'm not crazy. I know how dangerous this is, but I have to be part of this. I already received my instructions. I'll be working with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, delivering aid to the different rest stops along the march route. And I'll be recruiting and driving the marchers and volunteers. Sarah, I'll be making a difference. And making enemies? Listen to me. Every Klan member, every bigoted redneck, every fool with hate in his heart will target you. Even some Negroes will be skeptical of your intention. You'll be hit with hate mail, phone threats, cross burnings, and maybe worse. Are you prepared for that? Yes. I is just too dangerous. You know what happened during the first march? Yeah, I know. I should be afraid, but I'm not. I don't know why, but I'm just not. I believe in this fight. I have an opportunity to do something concrete with my life. Something historic. And the civil rights movement is that opportunity. You can't talk me out of this, Sarah. I'm going to Selma. At that time, Selma, Alabama was seen as the epicenter of the civil rights movement. As Viola Liuzzo prepared herself to leave her husband and children, Penny, her nine-year-old daughter, entered her room with tears in her eyes. Mommy, why do you want to leave us? No, honey, no. I'm not leaving you. I'm just going away for a little bit. Mommy has a job to do. I don't understand. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure I understand it all myself. But you know how I'm always talking to you children about knowing right from wrong? Uh Uh-huh. You know those people we've seen on the news in Selma, Alabama? Well, they're marching for their rights. The same rights that you and I have are denied to them. Why? 
for no other reason than the color of their skin. Now that's wrong, don't you think? Yes, but I heard in school it's dangerous in Alabama. I'm afraid I'm never going to see you again, Mommy. I know it. I just know it. Oh, honey. I'll go for you. Please. Please, Mommy. I'm little and I can run fast. Let me go in your place. Oh, sweetheart. That's very brave of you. But you don't have to worry. You'll see me again. Of course you will. And you know why? Because I'm going to be very extra special careful. And I'll be back before you know it, honey. Promise. But, Mommy... I'll tell you what, Penny. Since you're doing so well with your cursive writing in school, how about you write me a letter and leave it on Mommy's nightstand so I'll have something nice to read when I come home. Would you do that for me? Yes. That's my big girl. I love you with all my heart. And that's what's going to bring me back to you. Because love always protects you from any danger. Did you know that? No. Well, it does. Now, don't you forget to write me that letter. I won't forget. I love you, Mommy. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. Now I feel really protected. This is African American History is American History. On March 25th, after the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led thousands of nonviolent demonstrators on a five-day, 54-mile march from Selma, Alabama, to the steps of the Capitol in Montgomery, Viola Liuzzo helped drive local marchers back to their colleges and homes in her 1963 Oldsmobile. She was assisted by Leroy Moton, a 19-year-old African-American. As they were driving along Route 80, a car with four Birmingham Chapter Klan members who had traveled to Selma for the purpose of disrupting the campaign and discouraging any future outside supporters pulled up alongside her car and shot her twice in the head, killing her instantly. Her car veered into a ditch and crashed into a fence. Although Moton was covered with blood, the bullets had missed him. He lay motionless when the Klansmen reached the car to make sure their victims were dead. After the car left, he began running for the next half hour, looking for help. He eventually flagged down a truck driven by Reverend Leon Riley, who was bringing civil rights workers back to Selma.
Iola Liuzzo's funeral was held at the Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic Church in Detroit on March 30, 1965. Many prominent members of both the civil rights movement and government came to pay their respects, including Martin Luther King, NAACP Executive Director Roy Wilkins, Congress on Racial Equality National Leader James Farmer, and Teamsters President Jimmy Hoffa. Dr. King later spoke with Viola's eldest daughter, Penny, at the funeral. She's right over here, Dr. King. Penny, your mother spoke so fondly of you and your brothers and sisters. I'm just so sorry to meet you under these circumstances. My mother and me saw you on TV once. She said you're an important man. Well, that was very kind of her to say, but your mother was just as important. Sadly, there are very few people like her in this world. People who have the strength to stand up for what is right, even though they know how dangerous it is to do so. <laughs> Annie, it may not seem like it to you now, but your mother did not die in vain. No matter what mean and hateful things people may say about her, she was a good person, with a kind soul, and that makes her a very important person. <laughs> Thank you. This is African American History's American History. In the aftermath of Viola Liuzzo's death, her good friend Sarah Evans became the permanent caretaker of her five young children. Less than two weeks after her murder, a charred cross was found in front of the Liuzzo residence. The four Klan members in the car, Collie Wilkins, William Eaton, Eugene Thomas, and FBI informant Gary Thomas Rowe were quickly arrested and within 24 hours, President Lyndon Johnson appeared personally on national television to announce their arrest. We worked all night long, starting immediately after the tragic death of Ms. Viola Liuzzo on a lonely road between Selma and Montgomery, Alabama. Arrests were made a few minutes ago of four Ku Klux Klan members in Birmingham, Alabama charging them with conspiracy to violate the civil rights of the murdered woman. Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, our honored public servant who is standing here by me, has advised that the identities of the men charged with this heinous crime are as follows. Eugene Thomas, age 43, of Bessemer. William Orville Eaton, age 41, also of Bessemer. Gary Thomas Rowe, age 31, of Birmingham. And Collie Leroy Wilkins, Jr., age 21, of Fairfield, Alabama. Mrs. Leuze went to Alabama to serve the struggles for justice. She was murdered by the enemies of justice, who for decades have used the rope and the gun and the tar and the feathers to terrorize their neighbors. They struck by night, as they generally do. For their purpose cannot stand the light of day. My father fought them many long years ago in Texas, and I have fought them all my life, because I believe them to threaten the peace of every community where they exist. I shall continue to fight them, because I know their loyalty is not to the United States of America, but instead to a hooded society of bigots. Men and women have stood against the Klan at times and at places where to do so required a continuous act of courage. So if Klansmen hear my voice today, let it be both an appeal and a warning to get out of the Ku Klux Klan now and return to a decent society before it is too late. I call on every law enforcement officer in America to insist on obedience to the law and to insist on respect for justice. No nation can long endure, either in history's judgment are in its own national conscience. If hoodlums are bigots, 
can defy the law and can get away with it. Justice must be done in the largest city as well as the smallest village, on the dirt road or on the interstate highway. We will not be intimidated by the terrorists of the Ku Klux Klan any more than we will be intimidated by the terrorists in North Vietnam. We will reduce us of those who suffer now in a society free of the Klan and those who support its vicious work. I am asking and directing Attorney General Katzenbach to proceed at the earliest possible date to develop legislation that will bring the activities of the Klan under effective control of the law. And I am hopeful that that legislation can be submitted just as soon as we can get the present voters' rights legislation uh, through the Congress. And in connection with new legislation, congressional committees may wish to investigate the activities of such organizations and the part that they play in instigating violence. And I hope that if the congressional committees do decide to proceed forthwith, they can be assured of the cooperation of all patriotic Americans. And certainly we will make all the resources of the federal government, the Justice Department, and the FBI available to them. All were indicted for Liuzzo's death, except for Roe, who served as a witness. All white juries were selected for the trials. All three resulted in mistrials. The FBI was still concerned that they might be held accountable for their informant Gary Rowe's role in the murder. So he was kept in the Federal Witness Protection Program, while then-FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover initiated a campaign to discredit Viola Liuzzo in the eyes of the public. Hoover leaked false allegations to the media that she was an unfit mother, a drug addict, purposely went down south to have sex with black men, and that her husband was involved with organized crime. Despite the fact that there wasn't a shred of evidence to back up Hoover's allegations, several newspapers still decided to run with these claims. A Ladies' Home Journal magazine survey, taken a week after Viola Liuzzo's death, asked its readers what kind of woman would leave her family for a civil rights demonstration. Tragic. Simply tragic. But that's what happens when you go down there, meddling in... Negro affairs. Her responsibility should have been with her family, not running around like one of those beatniks. Oh, you are so right. Leaving five children to go march. <laughs> For rights, she already has. I heard she was a C-O-M-M-U-N-I-S-T. No. Yeah. Oh, I feel sorry for the children having a mother like that. Oh, yes, those poor things. She had no right being down there and leaving them. You know, her husband's in the M-A-F-I-A. <gasps> ah, plus, he drinks. No. Yes, those poor children. Tragic. Do you think they'll grow up as delinquent as her? Oh, I suppose so. 55% of the readers thought she brought her death on herself. If there is one positive thing to come out of Viola Liuzzo's death, it's that Despite the FBI's smear campaign, her murder was one of the most important factors in helping to pass the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which removed barriers to voting, such as literacy tests and poll taxes. In 1991, she was honored by the women of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with a marker on Highway 80, where she was murdered. Her name is also inscribed on a civil rights memorial in the Michigan State Capitol. Viola Liuzzo was only 39 years old when she died.
This show was written and directed by Harlan Kearsley. The production coordinator is Patricia R. Floyd. Our engineer was Kathy Gormley. The cast for the Viola Liuzzo story included Crystal Williamson as Upscale Woman Number 1, Patricia R. Floyd as Upscale Woman Number 2, Benja K. Thomas as Sarah Evans, Aislinn Berry as Penny, and Sarah Cushing Downs as Viola Liuzzo. On behalf of everyone here at African American History's American History, thank you for listening. And remember, none of us can truly embrace the future until we first confront the past. And please join us on Facebook. African American History's American History is copyrighted. H.C. Kearsley. 2014.